also uh, an officer in the United States Air Force as a, as a doctor and a flight surgeon. And uh, he has been with uh, Mercy Sleep Center, where he's the director for about three years. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Boulder, Colorado. That's the Flatirons. That's my home. That's where I hail from. This is kind of where I train. This is the University of Colorado. Uh, this next slide is just a, a brief picture of, of Dartmouth Medical Center, where I did my residencies and, and fellowship training. This next slide is uh, where I learned to be a flight surgeon, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. So I, I come from a little bit of a varied background, having uh, studied in aerospace medicine, internal medicine, psychiatry, and then sleep medicine, and trying to kind of tie that all together, uh, looking at this multidimensionally, not just from one aspect of sleep. And flight surgery is like doing an appendectomy in an airplane? Yeah. Is so flight, yeah, flight surgery is, uh, it sounds really cool. And you get to wear a flight suit and, and you get to fly. But essentially what you are is a primary care physician for air crew. And um, a, a lot of the services believe that the, the best way for a physician to take care of pilots is to understand the aviation environment. So they do send you to flight school. They do let you fly the aircraft to understand the challenges of the aviation environment. So it, it, it is a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. All right, so a little bit on, on history. So uh, this is a great quote, right? Sleep is the golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. And uh, this is a quote from a gentleman by the name of Thomas Decker. Uh, Thomas Decker was an English Elizabethan dramatist and pamphleteer, a, a versatile, a prolific writer. His career spanned several decades and brought him into contact with many of the period's most famous dramatists. And this next quote is from a colleague of his which is um, from Shakespeare. Uh, sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, and chief nourisher in life's feast. So, you know, we can see practically that sleep has been an issue and a topic that's been spoken of for millennia. Um, what I like to do is to just kind of keep a perspective on sleep not only you know historically but just trying to take a look at a nuts and bolts approach of sleep medicine and sleep specialties whether people are going to their primary care provider and having troubles with sleep people that are in the midst of a healthcare challenge and dealing with a lot of subspecialists and kind of struggling with sleep but at the end of the day we, we spend a third of our life sleeping it has an intrinsic role in in our health and our daily well-being so um onward and upward here, um, looking at the concept of sleep and cancer, I tried to put this talk together, looking at it from a, a multidimensional perspective. And predictably, we know that a lack of sleep increases your risk of some cancers. And there exists plausible evidence of a link between insufficient sleep <laughs> and the risk of cancer. So in particular, people with circadian rhythm disorders in which the body's biological clock is disrupted because of shift work may clearly be at an at increased risk. So when we use, we use a lot of words in medicine that can be kind of confusing in Latin, but you know, circadian comes from circa around and the word dia, day. So we kind of put together sleep, you know, generally when the sun's not out and we try and be awake when the sun is up. So looking at uh, known human carcinogens, and, and this comes from the International Agency for Research on Cancer, we, we obviously know there are some things that are particularly harmful uh, to humans. And some examples below are listed as, you know, benzene, uh, asbestos, uh, coal from indoor emissions from combustion, formaldehyde, hepatitis C, plutonium. We know that, that this further extends to alcoholic beverages, processed meat, solar radiation, and leather dust. So if we take a look at some lifestyle consequences we have, this kind of speaks to that slide. Um, we also know that, you know, looking at it uh, from a probable carcinogenicity, group 2A recommendations also speak to some things that are maybe not that intricately familiar to us, such as very hot beverages, red meat, uh, being a hairdresser, such as uh, being a barber or workplace exposures. And then lastly, what we know from shift work that involves circadian disruption. So life is always about playing the odds and trying to limit risk factors for, for everything we do in life. There's kind of 
there's deci- there, there, there's choices, decisions, and then consequences. But what we try and you know take a look at is is what we're trying to do, what kind of decisions we're making, and what's the best play for us in life. And I often have this discussion with my daughter, who's in her first year at Iowa as a Hawkeye, that uh, you know there are Hawkeyes, and you know they're, they're a really good football team. And sometimes after they get done playing football, you can go out in the parking lot and see a lot of this, right? But where I went to school at the University of Colorado, their football team would look like this, but in the parking lot you'd see a lot of this. So. Like anything in life, there, there are things that, that we choose to expose ourselves to. There are choices that we make and consequences. But the, the important part here is to understand that for um, people with shift work, uh, a lot of this is related to their careers, what they do, and, and the type of hours they keep. Um, this is a, a quick slide. I wish you could uh, blow up a little bit further. But, but looking at like some things that people intrinsically think are, are different and dangerous, but looking at you know cannabis and tobacco, tobacco smoke are not equally carcinogenic. So there, there's a spectrum of things that, that we indulge in life, whether it's lifestyle choices, work or occupational exposures that put us at greater risk or harm. Uh, this uh, is an article I grabbed from The Lancet that looked at, at night shift work and its uh, carcinogenicity. Um, I'm not going to kind of go through the text of it, but, you know, th- this is a little bit of a hard topic to, to dissect. And my favorite joke is, you know, if, if you get five epidemiologists in the room, four out of five of them will all disagree with one another. But it, long story short, looking at this data, it can be very confusing. And I certainly believe that some people I may be speaking to with today who, who are listening to this lecture can understand that, that shift work is really hard and, and people that, that do indulge in shift work can have some bad habits, such as either a higher point prevalence of nicotine use, a higher point prevalence of caffeine use, a higher point prevalence of of maybe just some overall lifestyle decisions, especially around diet too, that can be kind of counterproductive and also puts them at a higher risk for all cause morbidity and mortality from cancer. And Steve, when we look at night shift, um, and I know it hasn't been probably um, sliced and diced and know exactly what it is. Do you think there's a greater risk in terms of carcinogenic effect if you're flipping back and forth between living part of your life sleeping uh, in the day and part of your life sleeping at night and you're going back and forth, which might be perhaps more disruptive to sleep than if you just live your whole life always sleeping during the day? Right, right. Well, yeah, great question. So what we know is that you know, there are multiple parts of our body that are circadian, not just our brains, our heart, our liver, our kidneys. And this has all been documented, you know, to suggest that there's, there's chronobiology in multiple organ systems in human beings. And I've truly never met a person that was genetically engineered to be a shift worker. This has been studied exhaustively. Much of the really interesting literature on this comes out of like old Eastern Bloc occupational medicine uh, surveys and research that they did. And long story short, they felt like the person that was the most resilient to shift work were postmenopausal females, 45 and older, with no children under the age of 20. And if you can find one of those people, that's your shift worker. That's the type of person that will have a higher, um, you know, showing up for work more predictably, a, a lower incidence of calling out sick, kind of being the more reliable worker. In, in most environments, and I'll use the military as an example, a lot of times they realize uh, on, on one level, it seems to make sense. Hey, if I'm going to be a night person, I'm going to be a night walker and just kind of stick to that schedule. But we understand that the rest of people's lives happen well outside of it. And shift workers are not generally married to shift workers, nor are their children going to shift work at school. And so there's a concept of a Panama schedule where sometimes people will shift forward through shift work, kind of going three nights on mids, two days off, then going to two nights on mornings, three nights off, two nights on days, three nights off, and and kind of adjusting forward and balancing it out and kind of playing the edges of it or splitting the middle. Um, I I find that that when I was, you know, when I was a resident, you know, back in the day, um, when I had to do my month of nights, I, I really almost didn't want to understand what day was like. So on the weekends, I try and stay on that that night kind of schedule because it was very, very disruptive to me. 
But I think that, you know, in the military and other organizations that do use the Panama schedule, they try and embed in the days off to let people try and float back in and out of a variable bedtime and rise time. I don't know if I answered your question, Dick, did I? Yeah. Okay. So um, again, those slides. So, so researchers suspect that a disruption in the circadian rhythm could pose a risk for developing cancer since the body's internal <laughs> clock affects so many biological systems. I, I tried to explain the language and articulate some of the definitions earlier. Uh, this is another study that, that looked at, for, this is a study from the International Journal of Cancer, found a relationship between women's irregular work schedules and the rate of breast cancer. This was a, a cohort where researchers compared 1,200 women who had developed breast cancer between 05 and 08 with 1,300 women who did not have a cancer diagnosis. And what they found essentially was that the women had at least four, women who had at least four years of night shift work, as well as those with fewer than three night shifts per week, were at the highest risk. And that shift work has also been shown to increase the incidence of certain cancers, for example, prostate cancer in men. So it's not completely gender biased. So I spoke a little bit before that there are, there are multiple systems that are circadian. It, it's not just the brain. We know it's the liver. And even for those that have you know, spent the night up, and again, I'm sure somebody in the audience here has, has, has worked at night. Um, I, I can kind of remember you know, just intrinsically knowing that when I was up, when I shouldn't be up, certain aspects of my functioning would be uh, less than optimal, specifically my GI system. I, I remember as a resident, like if I was post-call, I was not a huge fan of like eating a big breakfast or to me, just my whole digestive system that day was really off kilter. I know some other, you know, I remember residents just walking around a certain amount of like autonomic dysregulation, feeling disproportionately cold, e even like in a warm environment. So like we know that this impacts more than just our brain and our cognition. Some examples I said before, you know, salivary glands, your esophagus, these are all examples of organ systems in our body that we know are circadian. Um, you know, this, this, this is something that I stole from, from uh, complementary alternative medicine. Th this is in Chinese medicine. We, we often, in, in sleep medicine, we steal that yin and yang symbol as a way of representing night and day and the bi-directional nature of activity and sleep. But even for them, you know, they had mapped it out, you know, looking at different times of the day and then overall reactivity of different body systems, depending upon that time of day. And again, in sleep medicine, we've kind of stolen that and we've kind of. So we spoke a little bit about the brain and what I wanted to spend some time with now is, is just understanding um, some people can have a certain sensitivity uh, to light and dark. And, and, and kind of, a, I use this slide to suggest to people that even behaviors outside of our normal schedule can be very disruptive to us. And, and I use this example of if anybody's gone to a, uh, a movie uh, kind of in the earlier part of the day rather than the night, like a daytime matinee, hands up if you've ever done that. Yeah. Have you ever come out of like a dark movie theater and it's still like very light out and you kind of leave like the dark theater and you go out into a lot of sunlight. Do you, you, what did that feel like for you? Yeah, it, it's really kind of, and, and the fun thing is like, you can immediately see people look at their watch, like, oh my gosh, I thought it was so much later. And that's just with about two and a half to three hours in a dark environment. And, and so we know that usually uh, just that, that kind of, there's a German expression, Augenblick, like that eye blink, that one sensation of just feeling the sun on you and the activation of your retina um, can be very disorienting to patients. And, and those patients in particular I've seen, and this is kind of like level four, just Steve Grant <clears throat> anecdotal evidence, that these are people that are particularly um, um, sensitive to shift work. But uh, back in the day when I was a resident, that's not what I looked like. And those weren't the residents I would, I probably even couldn't do that nowadays. But, but what I remember is being very, very sleep deprived. And in the lobby of Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, there's this wonderful bakery called Oban Pan, or, or to the uninitiated bone pain. Um, 
oh, oh, Oban Pan, um, I spent most of my career trying to keep a body mass index less than 27, um, making really good choices around carbohydrate intake and, and my uh, dietary choices. But for some reason, um, when I'd be sleep deprived, this, otherwise known as a bear claw, would look like a very plausible thing for me to eat. And, and I might reach back to um, an earlier part of my talk where you know we talk about shift workers and and looking at all cause mortality and and the fact that when you're up at night and you're sleep deprived you're generally going to have you're, you're going to fall off the cliff first and foremost if it's not with trying to use an exogenous substance to maintain wakefulness either through nicotine or caffeine but making really poor choices around specific food items and, and we'll talk a little bit about that i kind of partial to their chocolate croissants yeah have you had yeah i know I know they're, they're, they're really awesome. Um, so lack of sleep is associated with overconsumption of uh, junk food. And, and what we know is that when we're sleep deprived, um, there's a certain receptor on our tongue that can be upregulated. It's, it's called the uh, umami receptor. Uh, so named in Japanese because they were the first ones to define it. And essentially, umami is the receptor. I think the best way to explain it is it's exactly like what MSG hits like monosodium glutamate and tercolates well, like the, it gives you like that deliciousness type of a, of a, of a response. And, and people will kind of upregulate around that when they're sleep deprived. Um, and, and preferentially, people will try and always choose foods that are salty and sweet. So let's talk a little bit about why this is. Um, when, when we're sleep deprived, there are two bad actors at work here. One is called ghrelin and, and one is called leptin. Ghrelin is what kind of stimulates appetite. And what some people will notice when they are sleep deprived is hunger, uh, when, you're, when your stomach's growling, so to speak, that technical term for that is borborygmy. But what we will see is increased levels of ghrelin that stimulate appetite. So people will then try and proximity seek to food items, but also a double whammy of uh, another neural hormone called leptin, which is, uh, for lack of a better term, our kind of enough meter. It's a satiety hormone. And when, and when it's not so much that we're, we're not making enough of it, we just become insensitive to it. In other words, there's upregulation of leptin because we become insensitive to it. So not only do we choose salty and sweet, you know, umami receptor related items to indulge, but when we start eating it, we, we don't really have that negative feedback to cut off when enough is enough. So when the body is sleep deprived, what we find is the, the ghrelin spike, the, the leptin level, the sensitivity actually falls and hunger strikes. So this is that age old math equation, the, the chicken and the egg, um, which came first. So, you know, it, it, it can be a little bit tough in understanding uh, when we look at shift workers and we, we look at food and we look at sleep deprivation, kind of teasing it apart can be a challenge. Um, Setting aside uh, diet and sleep deprivation, I wanted to talk a little bit more about another hormone. Uh, this is melatonin. I often get asked extensively uh, about melatonin for all sorts of different reasons, but melatonin is produced endogenously in humans by the pineal gland. Um, although the exact mechanism of action is unknown, it, it is thought to control the circadian pacemaker and promote sleep. We know that melatonin occurs naturally in some things that we can ingest in our diet, such as fruits, nuts, olive oil, and some wine. And then the supplemental form is used as a sleep aid. And, and I might just make an aside here um, to um, suggest that um, most people that use melatonin don't quite understand how it works. And the analogy of it kind of working <clears throat> classically like a sleeping medicine is not accurate. Like so let me just give for an example, a medicine like Ambien or, or, or maybe an over-the-counter sleep aid that you take. And then you see like within a short proximity, 20, 40 or 60 minutes, the soporific effect, that sleep inducing effect of, of, people, of people wanting to actually enter sleep. How melatonin works is a little bit different. And, and what the analogy that I use to explain melatonin is it's kind of like a, a surfer. If you've ever seen people surfing, you know, they're kind of like hanging out about 150 yards out from the shore. And they're kind of carefully looking at like which wave they might want to get on because the wave's got to be right. And they want to make sure it's a wave that they can they can approach. And then they time it kind of perfectly. They start paddling furiously and then boom, they get on the wave and they kind of 
wave the ride to the shore. That's kind of the analogy that I use with, with timing of melatonin and sleep onset. And generally what you want to do is you want to take melatonin 90 minutes to 120 minutes prior to when you actually want to fall asleep. You want to time it just right. And sometimes you need some wiggle room in that. But what I generally try and avoid is to say to anybody, this is not a medication that you're going to take and then immediately fall asleep. But then in the audience, invariably, I'll have a sea of hands shoot up going, oh, no, that's not how it works for me. And, and what you see is a, a, a number of people that have taken benign amounts of melatonin for decades of their life. They take their pill and they, and they go to sleep. And, and I would suggest to you that that's nothing more than um, – um, I know that that you were a, you were a, a military uh, uh, doctor. One that, one thing that's really cool in the military is it's not so much the rules of engagement are different, but you're definitely dealing with a different kind of subsegment of the population, generally younger, healthy people. And this is not to suggest that we routinely use placebo medications in the military, but I have seen remarkable things happen when you tell somebody that something's in an IV bag and something's going to happen to them. And we used to call that obacalp, which is the word placebo spelled backwards. And sometimes the, the code for a nurse was, you know, give them 100 milligrams of overkelp and stand back. And, and what we know is there's, a, there's an exceptionally strong placebo response to medications. And, and we even know this in, in medicine in general. I mean, we, we, of course, have the FDA to referee efficacy and, and potency of medications. But certainly there are some people that are going to respond to melatonin classically with I take it and I go to sleep. But from a chronobiologic standpoint, that's not how this works. I'll have to belabor the point. So melatonin has not been shown to treat cancer in humans, but you know, it has in vitro and in vivo studies that suggest that melatonin has antioxidant and anti-proliferative properties. This includes action against breast cancer cells, synergistic effects with anti-cancer treatments, and protective effects against adriamycin-induced cardiotoxicity. I, I don't mean to when I give these talks, and I'll just speak generally to the audience, I never quite know who my audience is. And so what I try and do is give enough of a lecture that, that lay people can, can easily track with it and go, wow, I didn't know that. But that people, you know, gentlemen and women of letters can kind of, you know, wander along with it, with, with it as well. So um, clinical trials evaluating melatonin as monotherapy or in combination with other agents and in patients with solid tumors suggest improvements in quality of life and, sur and survival time but that melatonin did not improve appetite, weight, quality of life in cancer patients with cachexia. Um, in studies of postmenopausal breast cancer survivors, there was short-term supplementation did not influence estradiol levels, but improved sleep quality. I know that sleep is a huge issue for our cancer survivors and our people that are battling cancer. Um, I don't generally like to talk uh, with specifics on medications, but, but it is often the case I find especially women that are battling breast cancer and, and put on, you know, estrogen receptor <coughs> modulators, CERM type drugs. And the first thing that falls off for them is sleep. And they're not super enthusiastic about getting on prescription sleep aids. And then the conversation kind of evolves into, hey, what do you know about melatonin? And these are some of the points that, that I'll put out there. Uh, data also suggest that melatonin may, may help reduce incidence of chemotherapy side effects, including the thrombocytopenia, the little platelet counts, asthenia, <laughs> the neurotoxicity, as well as minimize radiotherapy-induced reduction in blood cell counts, the pancytopenia, you can see the marrow suppression. And there are, according to a case report, oral melatonin may delay menopause in premenopausal women by modulating levels of follicular stimulating hormone, FSH, and estrogen. And that's another point that I'd like to kind of drive home. So not only is sleep related just in some of the organ systems, but also in our sex-related hormones, growth hormone, kind of rehearsing the um, anabolic uh, nature of sleep where we kind of do a lot of tissue repair from the day's oxidative stress. So so before we leave melatonin, sure. you talked about some of the potential beneficial effects. Uh, what are side effects of melatonin? Are there, if you were to take um, over-the-counter melatonin, not super high levels IV sure. or something in a clinical trial, does it have any significant um, negative effects? You know, the one higher all point prevalence of depression in patients. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean like, like really like morbid anergic depression, but if you take a look at their, their BDIs, their Beck depression inventories or PHQ-9s, these, 
these kind of like these subjective measures of their life. Um, you know, I, I want to say that the incidence is, is rather small, like on the order of three to four percent. But if I had to say one common thing that I, I will see in patients is it's not so much a real an anhedonic depression or real energic depression, but definitely like conversations around. I'm feeling a little bit more down lately. Um, other than that, with the doses that we take in the United States, you know, no, nothing greater than eight milligrams. I, I've not run across anything that suggests any clear, you know, toxicity. Every now and then, some patients will get some nausea from it, but I think that more be related. That might be more related to the vehicle that the melatonin is bundled. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the case with a lot of drug allergies? Right. right? right. It's it's not the drug <clears throat> that people are allergic to, but the pharmaceutical company and the binding agent or the vehicle in which the drug is being delivered. I'm going to ask another question, but if you're going to address it later sure. in the talk, just just let me know and we'll we'll defer it. Sure. So, um, patients who are having some sleep disorder, uh, just the difficulty sleeping, sure. and they don't want to take the time to go get a full sleep analysis, sure. um, and they're looking for an over-the-counter remedy. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, you want to address sure. uh, some of the over-the-counter remedy, Tylenol PM, yeah. Benadryl, sure. um, melatonin? Sure. Uh, do, do you think that some of them are more efficacious rather than placebo? Right. Uh, are there some that um, you would say steer away from? Sure. Um, how would you address over-the-counter remedies for people who are having uh, difficulty getting to sleep at night. Yeah, no problem. Um, well, I mean, there's there's been some real controversy around this, and and I, I my medical experience was informed by internal medicine, which is just give them whatever sleeper they want, and psychiatry, which is whoa, let's just make sure that we're like not causing a real problem, and 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 not to kind of spin your question a different way, but there's two types of insomnia. There, there's difficulty falling asleep, mm -hmm. and then there's difficulty staying asleep. So. One is called onset insomnia, and the other one is called maintenance insomnia. And, and they're strikingly different. Mo the vast majority of people with onset insomnia present with what we call a psychophysiologic or conditioned insomnia. In other words, they just end up with some really bad habits that compound on itself and just lead to, like, you know, fa you know failure just breeds more failure. And, and what they do is uh, a common narrative I see is just poor sleep hygiene where people will say, you know, I'm not sleeping well. It takes me about a half hour to fall asleep. So instead of going to bed at 10 o'clock, I'm going to go to bed at 930 so I can chew up that half hour so that I'm asleep by 10 o'clock. Well, it, it doesn't work that way. In fact, what you end up doing is you become more sleep inefficient. And any time that we're in bed not sleeping, we are unconsciously training our brain to be awake and, and interacting with our environment, even though we might not be interacting with our, our limbic system, our part of our brain is responding to our environment. And, and over time, what we know is that people that buy into that theory of the more time in bed, I'll invest on the front end to try and fall asleep, all that ends up happening is they lengthen their sleep onset latency or the time to actually fall asleep. And then they get frustrated and say, well, I saw an ad on TV or a, 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 an ad in, in the magazine about a sleep aid, or they go and, and talk to a pharmacist. And um, most of the over-the-counter uh, sleeping preparations either fall into the, the Tylenol PMs or the Advil PM or, or medicines like Benadryl, which is just standard diphenhydramine, which isn't an, a sleeping medicine. You're, you're using a side effect of that medicine, which is a, a profound anticholinergic property uh, to induce sleep. So you're using a side effect from that medicine, not the actual reason why people use that medicine to induce sleep. And it either falls into drugs like Benadryl or, or melatonin. And, and then thus starts, the, you know, thus speaks the word of the Lord. There's a vast majority of patients that just end up using it. And okay, it's episodic. There's a stressor in their life. They kind of negotiate it. They get over it. Um, there's a certain population that gets too frustrated and that's usually the population that unmasks with a, an undiagnosed anxiety <laughs> disorder. There's a strong comorbidity between anxiety and onset insomnia. And, but, and then there is the placebo effect they, and, they may get from taking right. a Tylenol PM. A, exactly. And, 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 and this is the part that, that really is another, you know, brain breaker for, and I don't mean to burst their bubble because I can't tell you how many times people want to, you know, <laughs> thrown eggs at me at the end of a sleep talk, but 
you know, we know that by like Le Chatelier's effect, I mean, j just by exposure to something, you know, there's habituation and a decreased efficacy and effect. So we know like physiologically, chronically taking 25 milligrams of Benadryl every night, you're not going to have that same antihistaminergic reaction to it, right? However, again, placebo effect mounts itself and they just clearly associate cause and effect. I take the pill and I go ahead and I wait my 20 minutes and I fall right asleep again. But again, from a physiology standpoint, it flies in contradiction to everything we know about pharmacology. Yet there are people that for decades have used the strategy successfully. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? So um, there's one, I'm, I'm laying in bed, I can't sleep. So I go to Yoga Nidra for mm -hmm. sleep. So it's just yeah. a sort of a meditation. And we got this uh, Jennifer and she's going to talk to me for 22 minutes. Yeah. And she's going to. Yeah. I, well, I, I'd break out my phone, Dick, if it was within. Yeah. <laughs> so 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 what do you what do you think about these sort of meditative? Huge, huge fan. Um, a, a lot of people will often say to me, why can't I fall so I'm going to repeat that, a huge fan. Huge fan. <laughs> Much prefer this over Benadryl. Correct. Yes. And and um, I don't have my cell phone on me, but uh, let, let me talk a little bit about this. Okay. Let, let me talk a little bit about this. So some people try and bumble into this on their own, and, and their version of an app or something to distract them is the television. Hmm. Bad idea. And hmm. in fact, there was one study done that the highest predictor for insomnia in the geriatric population is if they have a TV in their bedroom. So don't have a TV in your bedroom, okay? TV, no TV in the bedroom, ever. But um, even in my own life, I've been in environments where um, I've been challenged with sleep and I know how it feels. I mean, you're just anxious, you know, you're, you're, you're tired, you're, um, you just can't, you, you just become very, very hyper-focused on executing the activity. And it's almost like gripping sand. You know, like the harder you try and hold it, the more it slips away. But it seems intrinsically right that I should try and grip it, right? But you kind of get stuck. And um, what I uh, found, and even in my own practice uh, at the sleep center, is there is a, um, it's not so much hypnosis. And Dick, I, I like your idea here with uh, Yoga Nidra in as much that, you know, you can kind of walk your mind through pre-rehearsed scenarios to try and distract your mind from focusing on the execution of the activity. But I'm a huge fan of an app um, called Sleep With Me, and it sounds kind of creepy, but it, it, is, it is one of the most um, interesting apps, uh, I, I think, that came to market. And, and the guy that is the designer and brainchild uh, behind it, he doesn't come um, from a clinical background. He actually comes from a substance abuse background. And that's a completely different talk, but we know that there's a high point prevalence of people with insomnia and substance abuse. But the name of the app is called Sleep With Me. And essentially, it, it is not a meditation where you hear like a very soothing female voice or male, whatever, whatever it is you're into, kind of gently talk to you about, I want you to breathe in or I want you to breathe out or think of the ocean tides or you know whatever. What Scooter does is almost like a dissociative narrative. I mean, it's, it's something that to the uninitiated, if, if you heard it, it, it would almost sound like somebody's on a hallucinogenic trip. And what he's doing is mimicking what our brain does as we fall asleep. And, and I think that, you know, to those of you in the audience, right as you're going to sleep, you can kind of see a lot of disconjugate thoughts. Like your, your brain will start firing in very different directions. And it's almost like a, a semi-dreamlike state where you bounce around in, in a very kind of like incoherent narrative about maybe thinking about a plane trip when you were seven and then immediately thinking about your mom. And then maybe going back to driving in the rain. It, it's it, the arc narrative of your thoughts are, are not very collected. And what Scooter discovered is if you rehearse a, a very disconjugate arc narrative, you can kind of rehearse somebody into falling asleep unintentionally. And um, this, this is work. I mean, there's an objective database around this guy's work. Although interestingly, it, it's, it's not really promulgated because there's not a tremendous amount of money to be had by big pharma on it. And it's more of a cult-like following and insomnia circles. And some people have tried to tag on to it, but I think his treatment of the therapy, like non-pharmacologic interventions around mm -hmm. insomnia is very appropriate. 
Um, I don't know how to explain it other, other than for, for listeners to listen to it. But another way, it, it, it's almost like if you were going to go run on a treadmill, right? And somebody kind of lifted you up, but had your legs kind of moving and then very gently over time settled your body mass on the belt. And then eventually, you know, you ran. That's kind of my experience with sleep with me. And I use it. I mean, in, in epochs of my life where I'm mm. struggling with, okay. with onset insomnia. Do you think that part of that is that, so, so part of um, difficulty falling asleep that I would have is like a, I'm just perseverating over yep. to today's problems and Correct. I just can't let it go. Correct. And I'm just kind of over and over. And so when I get uh, uh, Jennifer here talking to me, I mean, she's focusing me on like a right. body scan and, and it's taking my mind off of these thoughts right. I'm having about the bad events or what's going to happen tomorrow right. and try to get me right. in a calmer mood with, without right. intellectually thinking about those other things that are keeping me awake. Right. Just wonderful, you know, constructive distraction. I mean, that's what I would call it. Mm -hmm. But all too often mm -hmm. I find people that are relying on other means like television is horrible. And the thing I like about the, the podcast is you can put it on a sleep timer. Mm -hmm. you, know, you yeah. can obviously, you know, and I think to, to some extent, televisions, you can put on timers as well, but it's much different and, and it's not priming your brain along that, that same track. You know, there are other interventions that are evidence-based um, around insomnia management. A very common one we see is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. And a lot of the literature around that is, I mean, it beat the pants off of a lot of head-to-head -head studies against actual drugs. So I mean, tell me a little bit, what's that entail? Cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy behavioral for insomnia. Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or, or CBTI. And, um, you know, Dick, I, I wasn't around a lot of SEALs, but but I remember one time I, I got near one. Now we're talking about Navy, Navy SEALs, SEALs, not, not right. the... Not the uh... Right. And, and I will never forget this experience, but this one young guy came in and he had just got done running a marathon and he had some, some knee pain. That was his chief complaint to the ER. And, um, and I know he had some interesting security people with him. So I know it was like, boy, this is kind of interesting. You're not a general. You're kind of a younger guy. And you got an outer regs haircut and a beard. Who is this person? But he got to the front of the line. He was seen. And I'll kind of cut to the chase. But he, he had a tibial plateau fracture. And, and I will never forget because when we called radiology, they're like, hey, ortho's still here. So if you want to consult him, make sure you do. And I, I go, there's no way this is a tibial plateau fracture. I grew up in Colorado. I know tibial plateau fractures. That is one of the most common skiing injuries you see outside of ACLs, okay? You have a tibial plateau fracture, that's a non-weight bearing orthopedic injury. This guy ran a sub four hour. In fact, if I remember correctly, he had a Boston qualifying time. And I almost argued with his radiologist saying, we can't be looking at the same film. And then of course, like this is back before EMRs were really, you know, portable and, and long story short, he had it and I was just dumbfounded. I just sat there going, I can't, I can't connect the dots on how you have this injury and telling me what you did. And this is the first time I ever heard the, the acronym um, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Except he said to me, Doc, I've got CBT training in pain. And, and I guess, you know, I don't know a lot about special operators, but I, they do believe that they're bulletproof. They do believe that they can fly. They do believe that they can operate on three days of sleep as well as maintain some degree of living with catastrophic injuries. And, and so I kept that little packet of CBT, the, the, that acronym in the back of my brain. Many years later, right, um, I was oriented uh, to uh, CBTI, which is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, which again is looking at kind of our perception is our reality of what we think we can do, we can do. And um, just like a huge component in treatment of cancer and getting over cancer is knowing you can do this. You, you're going to win this battle. It's a framework. It's a mindset. And so we can apply this, whether it's in sports psychology, pain management, any mechanism of human behavior, up to and including the human behavior that we know as sleep. And what CBTI does is immediately deconstruct a lot of the negative associations we have about insomnia, how we talk about it, how we frame it, how we feel about it. what is the internal conversation we're having in our minds about immediately, how do I, how do I self-reflect on my insomnia? What am I doing to perpetuate it? And then deconstructing all of those thoughts and then rebuilding 
one's consciousness around their insomnia. And, and I'm, I'm, it's almost disrespectful to suggest that that's an adequate explanation of it. But there are some cognitive psychologists that I work with in town that have formal programs that people go through. It's about 10 sessions. Um, the Department of Defense is huge on this. Aside from back pain and knee pain, insomnia is a huge, huge problem for war fighters for all sorts of different reasons. And they're big proponents of this. And the DOD basically hijacked uh, a book from the guy that designed it, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Peter Howery. And unfortunately, the government writes most literature at about like a freshman reading level, like an eighth grade reading level. Um, but they kind of redesigned and regurgitated the book. And, and we've used it in, in uh, you know, the global war on terror for deployed assets around the world. And a lot of guys can be and young women can be rather skeptical about it. Like, again, they're just like, I don't understand how reading about this or doing this exercise is going to influence my insomnia. And then they walk on the other side of it going, all right, I got it now. I understand it. And I won't belabor the point, but there's an evidence base where they've actually done CBTI trials head to head with drugs like Ambient. And guess who won? Hmm. The CBTI trial. So this is not just a lot of hocus pocus, but suffice it to say, um, that's a, a conversation about onset insomnia. Briefly, not to run over, because I can talk forever. Maintenance insomnia. That's not so much people that have troubles falling asleep. Mm -hmm but trouble staying asleep. People that wake up at 2 a.m. and just can't get back to bed in the morning. And then, you know, the brain starts or sometimes some things that can be um, reminiscent of, of onset insomnia, but different because they got no troubles falling asleep. It's difficulty staying asleep. Mm -hmm. In that population, I am more of a fan of having a conversation with a guy like me because more often than not, what you see is comorbidities around suggested sleep disorder, breathing, obstructive sleep apnea. Nia is the Latin term for air, like pneumonia or pneumatic tire. Anea or apnea in North American English is periods when people aren't breathing. Even though we call the disorder obstructive sleep apnea, actually what most people do have respiratory events that we call hypopneas. Hypo means low, like hypodermic needle, low in the skin. Hyponea, hypopneas in North American English. That's people that basically snore themselves and have very poor uh, ventilatory effort, poor tidal volumes. We, we, we use the analogy of a tide coming in and out as we breathe. And so the, these are people that kind of look like this when they sleep. So it's not that they're not breathing. It's just that they're not ventilating deep enough. And what ends up happening is it's not really changes in oxygen that's the bad player. A lot of people will say, oh, my oxygen levels are low. You can be surprisingly hypoxic for a very long time. I, I remember being you know, in, in bariatric medicine, I, I remember I got, as a flight doc, they always want pilots to understand what hypoxia feels like because you might be in a pressurized aircraft that loses pressure and not know it, and you might drop down your oxygen levels and not really be aware of it other than some super tentorial cue, cues that you might get. I remember being hypoxic and feeling really happy. I mean, really laughing very hard. So the mechanism around maintenance insomnia, I, I don't want to pound the hypoxia part, but what I want to talk to is the hypercarbia part where people have retained carbon dioxide. And, and for, if I was giving this lecture to medical residents or medical students, I would talk about the concept of, of a transitory respiratory acidosis where you're not getting rid of enough carbon dioxide. You're actually changing your pH. And there's, um, your body generally doesn't like three states. If, if you're sleeping, it will wake you up from. One is nausea. It's pretty much darn near impossible to fall asleep nauseous or to stay asleep if you're nauseous. The other one predictably is pain. And then the other one is acidotic states. Like you'll see people in DKA that also have really, really bad problems staying asleep. That's a completely different pathophysiology. But when you're talking about patients that are waking up in the middle of the night, you're eventually building up a level where like they're just not ventilating right. And then they're up. And then there can be some compensatory mechanisms afterwards where they wake up gasping. They wake up tachycardic with a high heart. They just don't feel well. I mean, they just wake up just not feeling right. It's, it's not a, a temporary arousal that they can easily then reachieve sleep from. In those patients, before I would suggest giving any substance, whether it's an over-the-counter medicine or melatonin, I'm going back to the treatment end on the onset part of the question, you, Pills won't help this. In fact, it'll make it worse because you're blunting your ability to arouse from sleep. That's why there's a relative contraindication to hypnotic medications 
sleeping medications in people with obstructive sleep apnea? I think I answered that question almost too well. <laughs> yeah, so waking up in the middle of the night deserves a sleep evaluation because right. it's uh, often a sign of bad airflow. Correct, <clears throat> correct, yep. correct, correct. So I'm going to plow along here. Okay. We, we had mentioned about sleep, ap uh, sleep and, and cancer, but I want to talk about sleep apnea and cancer. And there is a connection. Um, there was a team of researchers from uh, several academic institutions in Europe that analyzed a large data, spit, a data set of about 20,000 participants to learn between the ties of obstructive sleep apnea and cancer. Um, in this study, the, the patients, researchers looked at a link between the severity of sleep apnea, blood oxygen concentration levels, and a person's risk of cancer. The reason why we like to look at blood oxygen levels, it's just super easy to measure. All we need to do is put a pulse oximeter and look at the absorption of a certain wavelength of light, whereas it's infinitely harder to measure carbon dioxide levels, right? You need like a venous blood draw to do that. Right. And the oxygen is just a, that little clothespin thing that goes right. on, on the outside of your finger. Right. Gives and, you the oxygen saturation right. in your blood. Right. And, and chances are about 99.999% of the time when you're sleeping, and you have a low oxygen level, you have a high carbon dioxide level. So that's the correlate there. So um, recent studies have shown that low blood oxygen levels during the night and disrupted sleep, both of which are common in obstructive sleep apnea, may play an important role in the biology of different types of cancers. This area of research is still pretty nascent and new, and the effects of gender on the link between sleep apnea and cancer have not been sufficiently studied because largely it's men that we see not a large degree of women that we see in the sleep center. Um, they also found that, however, that women with more severe obstructive sleep apnea who had lower blood oxygen levels during sleep were more likely to have a cancer diagnosis than women without sleep apnea. And that, I think, goes back to the overall rubric around sleep disruption, not like oxidative stress per se. Uh, when it came to men, the researchers found that this trend did not apply. They found that men with severe sleep apnea were no more likely to have developed cancer than men without this condition. So that's a gender-based differentiation right there. Um, and again, this study was observational. So it's just kind of look back and kind of looking at you know, causality and associations, not clear linkage. Um, but you know, again, suffice it to say, we, we know that we can observe certain things in women with obstructive sleep apnea and certain things in men with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, just more on the kind of lifestyle factors. Um, I want to see if there's any better slides here. Yeah. So you know, what I would suggest on the obstructive sleep apnea part in cancer is understanding that. Most patients with obstructive sleep apnea are also appreciably fatigued and hypersomnic during the day. And they would also meet the technical de uh, differentiation of having a, a, a insufficient sleep based on the fact that their total sleep time is decreased. So again, you get into this confusing cohort of people that are kind of pharmacologically managing a lot of their daytime hypersomnia with either nicotine, caffeine, or kind of those poor food choices. So it kind of gets into a little bit of a confusing mixed up picture as far as taking a look at health consequences and sleep, but I tried to, in this talk, kind of carve out some points on circadian disruption and rhythmicity, as well as obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia. Um, it's a complicated affair to accurately measure sleep, and sleep duration and sleep quantity in human study participants can be somewhat difficult to measure. I, I often get approached by patients saying, how much sleep do I really need? And we know that eight appears to be that magic <coughs> number, but eight is right at the 50th percentile of the bell curve. So guess what we know? 50% of people need more and 50% of people can get away with less. And what I find the easiest way to measure whether somebody is sleep is sufficient is if they're napping. Not a huge fan of napping. I, I might make some non sequiturs around that to suggest that if you were sleep insufficient that night and doing something that requires psychomotor vigilance, operating a motor vehicle or flying an aircraft, napping would be reasonable. But, but I'm going to go back to that, that yin-yang symbol that I spoke to earlier, that Chinese symbol of sleep and wake. And I think the easiest way to explain what sleep does is just as um, I know, Dick, you're going to get on a bike here in a little bit and go pedaling upstairs on, on the spinning machines. And, you know, if you hit that hard enough with the right resistance, you can feel lactic acid build up in your quads. You know, you're really burning. And, and that's a normal, like, oxidative stress from, from you know, like aerobic exercise. 
our brains do something similar to that. And, and the bet cells and neurons in our brain, as a function of being awake, build up adenosine. Um, adenosine, uh, when it reaches a certain level in our, in our brains, it touches the basal forebrain and heralds sleep. And what we know, one of the functions of sleep is, is to take the adenosine and turn it back into an energy substrate of ATP and ADP. And that's where we kind of hijack that yin yang symbol of we're up in our conscious and, and we're generating adenosine from being awake. And then when we're asleep, we're flipping the switch and changing the adenosine back into an energy substrate for our brain to use. So with that being said, we know that there are some people that can have a higher resilience to adenosine loads or, or, or a lower resilience. And that's where I think you come into the concept of um, the short sleeper or the long sleeper. Uh, in medical school, my, my roommate was a, a short sleeper. And, and I really thought it was like a hyperbolic statement, you know, like, oh, I only sleep four hours a night. Oh, sure you do. This guy literally only slept four hours a night. And we know that there are some people that are blessed with the ability to kind of change enough of their adenosine load that they wake up refreshed and, maintain, and can maintain appropriate wakefulness. But then we know that there are other people that need nine or 10 hours. And that's their ideal sleep load. And we know that there's a strong genetic correlation to this, that short sleepers give birth to short sleepers. But to walk around and say, hey, eight hours is a one size fits all approach, I think isn't very reasonable or very erudite. So I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, one, um, let's just say eight hours is the average. Mm -hmm. And so we have evolved over, I mean, how many millions of years? And so there's this sort of anthropologic view of the human body that, that, uh, that, that things that we are doing now must have some significant benefit. And for us to, to need to sleep a third of our lives, yep. obviously that's a pretty important function. And, um, where I'm, I, most of us don't know exactly what's going on. You gave us one insight in terms of the adenosine and the ATP. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other uh, current theories for the important things that happen during sleep that make it so essential to being a human being? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Dick. And, and I, I think that, um, I mean, a couple, couple of interesting points. I mean, historically, if you take a look back you know, prior to the industrial revolution. And you take a look at, you know, agrarian economies where people were on farms. Um, people didn't sleep all night. In fact, they, they segmented their sleep. Like if you take a look at, at a lot of journals, you know, even going back into the late 19th century. And even if you look at like older literature, there was this concept of like the Vespers hour where like, you know, people would wake up in the middle of the night and pray. Um, you know, predictably, there are things to do at night that would suggest that segmenting your sleep instead of doing it in one big chunk, but doing it in two chunks was kind of like an accepted practice. And so what we know historically, at least from from most records, and this is going back to like observations of Galen, people that 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 knew in antiquity and would write about life, that the concept of one chunk of sleep was kind of rare. However, the industrial revolution happens and we're able to generate artificial mm. light. And to such a degree, right, like this light to me is very, very bright. It, the photic stimulation for this, I'm going to, I mean, I can just tell you right now, if, if I had to stare at this, I, I think my sleep onset latency tonight is going to be delayed because this is, this is way too bright of a light. Like right now, my brain is telling me, hey, Steve, it's not 630 at night, my guy. It's about noon. Well, thank God for CBTI. Right. No, thank God for Scooter and sleep with me okay that's okay. what i'd go to but but okay. just just the toxicity of this light right now could change my my inner clock and and what we know is with the dawn of the industrial revolution what we saw were were people that were leaving agrarian economies where it was segmented sleep kind of non-traditional work hours working during the day and then trying to set you know to consolidate their sleep at night so right around you know the late 19th century we see more people trying to basically modulate darkness, sleep from this time to this time, and then kind of generate their day based on what I, what I believe to be artificial, uh, again, in, in, in sleep, we use a lot of German, but zeitgeibers, a lot of time givers, mm -hmm. whether that's just like an alarm clock to get up, to go to work, and not so much the dawn and looking at like the standard circadian rhythm time givers, which is sunset and sunrise. 
But don't you need to be asleep long enough to get into REM? And isn't there some healing or restorative? I mean, whether it is yeah. you're, 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 you're storing the memories, you're uh, reinforcing things you learned, you're, uh, yep. you're uh, I mean, I've heard theories that uh, dreaming just allows you to deal with some of your stress without the consequences. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, honestly. Can you get that with episodic sleep? It, well, enough you know, REM. Sure. There, there are people. Well, it's interesting. There are people I see that don't get into REM sleep and mm. intrinsically think, mm. oh, my gosh, something's wrong with them. Mm. I know that there are some people that, that don't get into REM biologically is, is a phase of sleep. In, in normal human adults, we, we sleep in different stages. There's stage one sleep, stage two sleep, stage three sleep, and then REM. OK. Um, REM in a, in a normal adult should be around like 19 to 27 percent of total sleep time. A couple of fun facts about REM sleep is, is that we're, we're tonically paralyzed during REM. There, there's only two sets of skeletal striated muscle online. Our, our diaphragm, which allows us to generate negative interthoracic pressure to breathe, and our lateral rectus muscles, which triggers the rapid eye movements associated with REM. A lot of sleep researchers have shown that decreases in REM states um, will certainly impact learning. Dick, you just mentioned that, something about memory. And, and a lot of times what we'll see is we'll do sleep studies on college kids or medical students, people in very high stress learning environments where they have a very robust amount of REM. And when their REM is, is interrupted or, or not allowed to progress, they actually have difficulty with memory consolidation, short-term memory consolidation. And then when you allow them to have the REM sleep, they can kind of all pull it together. Um, I know that, that I, I rarely run across people that are segmenting their sleep naturally. Most segmented sleepers I run across are suffering from like obstructive sleep mm -hmm. apnea and just kind of, well, I'm just always up every day from about two to four. And let me tell you why REM is more prevalent in the second half of the night. And if you think about it, if you think about it, to generate negative intrathoracic pressure in order to ventilate, we actually use a lot more than just our, our, our diaphragm. We use our intercostals. And when those muscles are offline in REM, that's when we start to see the manifestation of most of the ventilatory impact of obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. So that's why you see people with obstructive sleep apnea waking up in the second half of the night and not the first half of the night. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, we're almost out of time. I have one question. Um, I think, wow, I just keep talking. I know. So, you're not I'm a not big fan of slides. naps. You're not a big fan of naps. Right. So, I, I, I heard this on NPR, so it's got to be true. Sure. So, there's a study in, in, in Spain, as yeah. you know, yeah. in uh, Spain and siesta. Latin America, the siesta. siesta. And then, of course, like everything else, Spain came into the modern world and the siesta has gone yeah. away. Yep. And this was uh, then correlating pre uh when when siesta was common to now when siesta is not common and some health consequences that they think yep. have come into play including perhaps an increased risk of cancer and so um is that whole siesta uh is that just a cultural thing is there something um biological is it is it segmented sleep because they stay up late at night because they don't go to dinner till 10 p.m and that it's part of a segmented sleep yeah. process yeah. well it's it, it's 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 yes and no uh, not to be a dialectic about it but um so remember again so I, to I told you before about circadian rhythmicity and body temperature. What we see around 1300 hours or one o'clock in the afternoon is a one to two degree dip in our body temperature. And that to some people definitely correlates with some degree of sleep inertia. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of people ascribe that to a, a noon meal ingestion. Like, oh man, I'm carved out. I had a big lunch. I got to sleep. Not technically true. What you're seeing mm -hmm. is more of your own sensitivity to that body temperature change, which is going to cue you to want to go to sleep. And uh, Spain is one of those countries that just kind of ran with it. And they kind of baked it into their culture that from about one o'clock in the afternoon to three, people are offline. And I would suggest, Dick, I didn't see a lot of sleeping <laughs> myself. What I saw was a lot of cigarette smoking and congregating. I mean, like people will literally leave their jobs. But then the other interesting thing is like banks and other institutions are open until like seven or eight at night. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, their whole society, it's like the exact opposite in Germany, like where everything's closed by three, you know? So if, if you go to Spain and you see this, and I haven't been in Europe in, in the last, well, I was over in Italy briefly, but I, I haven't been embedded in culturally, but, but um, 
I, I understand what you're saying, but I personally have never seen a Spaniard go, hey, you know, it's siesta time. Let, let's go ahead and sleep. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go sleep with Scooter. Right, yeah. For a Scooter. couple hours. Yep. Well, this has been great. We're going to definitely have you back. I, I got lots more questions for you, uh, but we're out of time. So thank you, Dr. Steve Grant. Yeah, thanks um, so much for your time and attention. For being with us. We're yeah. Mercy One Clive Sleep Center. Any questions or concerns? We love the feedback. I can talk for hours about this topic. And I, 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 I please forgive me for the indulgence of going over a little bit. And if uh, any of you that are watching it want to watch again, or if you want to send the link to folks that couldn't join us tonight, this will be online and be able to be viewed again at the Mercy Cancer Center website or the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.